Last week, I used this book, Metamorphosis by Ovid, to talk about a few Greek gods and a few other stories from Greek mythology that I think would translate really well into a D&D session or whole campaign, and y'all liked it. So we're gonna do another. So if you want, go back and watch that part one. It doesn't have to be in chronological order. You don't have to watch that one before you watch this one, but I'm going to do pretty much the same structure that I did with that one. I'm first going to talk about some gods that I think are basically archfey in their behavior when we get into D&D talk. I then want to talk about different stories that we see in this book, some of which involve the gods and some of which don't, that I think could either be translated or turn into storylines or just like have interesting concepts. Oh, and a note on that last video, if you want way more ideas than I gave, check the comments. Y'all have so many good ideas. I love reading them, even if I don't reply to all of them. So yeah, leave me more comments this week. I wanna see what ideas you have. All we're doing is just stealing from each other, but in a fun way. And before we get started, I want to give a quick content warning because this book includes a lot of themes and motifs around sexual assault and self-harm and suicide. And it was written in a time where there was also a lot of victim blaming and violence, and it's a rough read if those are difficult topics for you to stomach. So just letting you know, I might touch on some of those during this video, but I'm not going to linger on them. Greek gods and D&D Archfey are similar in that they are petty, they are powerful, and they are selfish. I mean, they're entertaining. I will give you that. Because gods aren't always doing these grand acts and not everything turns into a massive drama. In one of these stories, Mars and Venus or Ares and Aphrodite, the god of war and the goddess of love are doing the second thing. They're having an affair, even though Ares is married, which I kind of like for the D&D world. If there was some sort of archfey or god, if we're not talking about the Feywild, that represented war and one that represented love, if they were getting all mixed up together and that was impacting the world in somehow, I think that could be really interesting. But some mortal tips off Ares' wife to what's happening and she sets up this trap where she puts like a chain or a net or something in their bed. And when they go to do it, it closes up around them. They are caught naked. And the conclusion of that is they're just laughed at. And it's a story that the gods tell for a little while. But the main goddess I want to talk about in this video is Juno, AKA the wife of Zeus, who is the queen of being petty and revengeful. I started reading and then I need to pause real quick. One more quick content warning, dismemberment of a child. She's upset because my rival son is able to transform men into fishes and plunge them in the sea to make a mother dismember her own child and slip weird new wings over on the three daughters of Minyas. What can Juno do but weep for slights and insults unavenged? Should that content me? She has this realization that she is angry about something she's been insulted and the only course of action that is empowering to her is to lash out and make the woman she's angry with go mad. And at the conclusion of the story, when she has made the woman go mad, and I'm gonna go further into that later in the video, a few people are upset about how it all goes down and they are mourning and Juno is angry at them for being sad that the people they love have died and so she turns them into seabirds. Each one inhabited her final gesture, and those of the attendants who escaped this cruel fate were turned into seabirds who skimmed the surface of those troubled waters. Oh yeah, the other ones were also driven to madness and died. But those who didn't were turned into birds. It's not wise to challenge a goddess or anger a goddess or to speak against one. And even if you don't do any of those things, you might find yourself in a path of revenge anyway. Just being sad over the results of something a goddess has done or God can mean your death. The Feywild is a place of emotion and Archfey are driven by their emotions and their realms even reflect that emotion itself if they lean more towards one or if they lean towards chaos. And the other reason I like Greek gods as Archfey more than I like them as gods is because they specifically interact with mortals. So I'm going to talk about Athena again. I know I touched on her last week, but I have one more story before I get into the next section that I think kind of drives this point home. So there's a mortal woman called Arachne, who, it was said, accepted praise that set her above the goddess in the art of weaving, referring to 
Pallas, Athena, Minerva, she's referred to by all those names in this passage. Her art has made her famous, and you would have known that only Pallas could have been her teacher. Nevertheless, as though offended by that very thought, the girl denied it, saying, let her compete with me, and if she wins, I'll pay whatever penalty she sets. Athena shows up disguised as an old hag and tries to change the girl's mind convince her that she is being too bold, that she needs to back down. And this isn't necessary for the video, but it's so hilarious. Her response, Arachne's response, she says, you've lived too long, you senile nincompoop. That's what your trouble is. What word in ancient Greek translates to nincompoop? They actually end up having a weaving contest and where Arachne really goes wrong is she depicts in what she creates a number of gods and goddesses doing things, many of which have been discussed in the book already, that are best described as misconduct, wrong, not right. Athena is furious and strikes at Arachne's face repeatedly, um, who could not bear this, the ill-omened girl, and bravely fixed a noose around her throat, while she was hanging, Pallas stirred to mercy, lifted her up and said, though you will hang, you must indeed live on, you wicked child, so that your future will be no less fearful than your present is. May the same punishment remain in place for you and yours forever. And she turns Arachne into a spider, destined to weave forever. Can you hear the word Arachne, Arachnid? Some of you probably already knew this story. I talked about Athena last week because she's such an interesting figure to me. She's a goddess of wisdom, a goddess of war, she is a goddess of the hunt, and she's also a goddess of, oh, I don't know if craftsmanship is the right word, but of weaving and like making beautiful things and arts with her hands. And when driven to anger whether someone meant to anger her, whore. and when driven to anger whether the person angering her meant to or not, Athena responds brutally. I've said it before, I will continue to say it, Greek gods and archfey are petty and they respond violently and they have these extreme emotions that I think makes them really translate well. And that story, like so many others, leads us into the main theme of this book, metamorphosis, transformation. Humans, gods, beings of all kinds transform in these stories. They change, mostly physically. Even plants and animals will transform depending on some sort of story around it. A lot of these are creation stories that the Greek gods, that the Greek gods told, that the Greek people told and the gods were involved. Words are hard. And again, stories of transformation are perfect for the Feywild. They can be included in other places in D&D, but that sort of chaotic magic of just snapping your fingers and turning someone into a mouse that's very fake. I'll give you a few stories and encounters that I encourage you to include or adapt, whether as lore or as circumstances a party might come across. I'm not gonna be too specific, just like last time, because it's kind of up to you what you think you need to do with this. If you know the story of Romeo and Juliet, you will know the story of Thisbe and Pyramus, because it's the same story. <laughs> Thisbe and Pyramus are in love. Their families don't want them to be together. They decide to run away and meet that night at a tomb. It's Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Thisbe gets there first, and while she's waiting for Pyramus to show, a lioness appears. The lioness is bloodied. Thisbe runs into the tomb and hides, but the lioness just showed up to drink from like a fountain in the area and then finds a cloak that fell off Thisbe's shoulders when she runs. And so the lioness gets her drink, goes to the cloak, tears it up a little, bloodies it, and then walks away. Before Thisbe comes back out, Pyramus finds her cloak bloodied, believes that she has died and stabs himself. And the description of him stabbing himself in here? <laughs> if you want vivid, colorful language, read Metamorphosis. The man is bleeding out and Thisbe comes out and finds him. She's distraught and she stabs herself too. All of this is happening under a mulberry tree and Thisbe cries out to the tree, and you, O oh mulberry, whose limbs now shade one wretched corpse and soon will shelter two, display the markings of our deaths forever in the crimson of your fruit, the likeliest memorial for two who perished here. She falls upon her blade, her parents and the gods yield to her prayers. For now the mulberry's ripe fruit is dark, 
and their blent ashes share a single urn. In our own Feywild setting, I am really interested in creating a forest with trees with white fruits and one in the center. This sounds kind of Garden and Evesque and you could do some stuff with that, but one in the center with red fruits and making it the site where some sort of tragedy happened. I don't know if I would make it haunted or if they would need that fruit for some reason or if it would have certain magical properties or if there's something else here like an urn that they need to retrieve. I don't know, maybe it's just a place they're passing through, but I think it would be really interesting to have a sort of tragical place where it's peaceful and beautiful and calm now, but clearly there's an air a something horrible having happened in this place. As I go into this next section, I haven't said this yet, but I might be pronouncing some words wrong. I'm sorry. Dionysus is having a feast, and the daughters of Minyas continued with their work, spurning the god, dishonoring his feast, when suddenly a dissonant outburst from unseen timbres, flutes, and cymbals broke upon them with a loud, disturbing clamor. The air now smelled of saffron and of myrrh, and unbelievably, their weaving greened. We talked in the last video about how Dionysus responded to another situation where he was being dishonored, slighted, put in a sort of dangerous, disgusting position, and he responded with vines and with grapes. He does the same thing here. Vines burst out of the tapestries, grapes start to grow, chaos emerges, and they start to go mad. It's kind of what Dionysus does best when he's upset. <laughs> Meanwhile, the sisters have been seeking refuge in various places from the glaring flames, and as they try to slip into the shadows, a slender membrane glides over their limbs, and meager wings enclose their withered arms. Darkness conceals from them the true extent of the great changes now come over them. Not downy feathers, but translucent wings sustain their flight, and when they try to speak, their much diminished bodies now emit only the very tiniest of voices, telling their woes in little high-pitched squeaks. They become bats. Is there a feast in your story that an archway or other powerful being is holding that he expects everyone to attend and celebrate? What are the consequences if people don't? Before we get into the next story, real quick, I want to read you these lines describing the underworld, only part of it's a long section. All of them are long sections. There are a thousand ways into this city, and open gates on all sides. As the ocean receives the rivers from around the world, so this place gathers in all mortal souls. It never fills, however many come. It's just so good. Here, bloodless, boneless, bodiless shades stray. What a line. But why are we in the realm of Hades? Because when these sisters are turned into bats, Juno is angry at a woman who is very like happy and braggy about what Dionysus has done. They're related in a way. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty. And Juno, as we read earlier, wants her revenge. So she is going to a fury to ask that fury or all of them or whoever wants to do it to make that woman go mad. The furies basically say, why not? And one of them goes to make the woman go mad, and the description is fantastic. They tried to flee the ill-omened fury there before them, who spread her arms, alive with tangled snakes, and shakes her locks out. Stunned, more serpents fall, come to her shoulders, others to her breasts, hissing and vomiting their deadly slaver. She throws the snakes at them, and when they go by, it's not the poison that these people have to worry about infecting their body, Snakes are poisoning their minds. Besides the serpents, she had brought along assorted other poisons and distempers, slaver from Cerberus, venom from the Hydra, hallucination, blindness, mindlessness. Those three words are capitalized, as are with sin and tears and rage and bloodlust too, all ground together in a fine powder, mixed with fresh blood and then brought to a boil in a great kettle made of bronze and stirred with a fresh green wand cut from a hemlock tree. The fury here reminds me of a hag, but I also wonder what other creature in D&D could take on the role of a fury or how you could translate the furies and put them into this world. Because that's terrifying, dark, disgusting magic. I want that in a story. Here's what we'll finish with. When the woman goes mad, she takes two babies. Another warning here for violence against young, innocent children. She takes two babies and jumps into the sea with them. But Venus, out of pity for her grandchild's unmerited distress, addressed her uncle caressingly, O Neptune, god of waters, and second in command in all of heaven, 
I realize that I'm asking much, but these are mine. I beg you to pity them, who, as you know, are plunged in the immense reaches of the vast Ionian Sea, and let them join you now as water gods. And Neptune does it. And then we get the seagulls and the people who are sad about the woman who jumped into the sea. But the last thing I want to comment on is that people in this world can become gods. In the Greek mythological world, we know the stories like, oh, Hercules, where Hercules can ascend to godhood. Or wait, did he start at godhood? Anyway, people can become gods. I am interested in the potential for beings becoming archfey, not being in the Feywild and gathering power and just like over time transforming into an archfey like Zabilna of Prismere does. I talk about her in another video, but instantly becoming an archfey. We have one guy in our campaign whose character he has given me full creative rights on for his backstory and where he came from. As far as he knows, he just appeared in the woods one day. And I have added an Archfey related circumstance to all of that and given his character the potential to become one himself. He just doesn't know it yet. The problem is that in order to become an Archfey, he would essentially have to become an enemy of the party and turn on them and accept a very dark kind of power from the Queen of Air and Darkness. Again, he doesn't know any of this yet. He's just having a good time, but I want to give them that sort of moral conundrum. You can have massive power, but you will be evil. But that is all I have for you today. I am so glad that you guys enjoy talking about Greek mythology and these stories and have so many great ideas of your own. So again, whatever you've used or any ideas you have or anything in this video that you really liked, comment below because I love reading what you guys say. I really do. But like, subscribe, do all that algorithm stuff. It helps me out so much. Have a great whatever it is, and I will see you next time. <laughs>